that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. I want to zero in on that that phrase in verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace. I want us to imprint that on our hearts this morning because I believe that's the goal, Paul's goal in writing this introductory uh, worship hymn to this Ephesian church is that we would respond with that phrase coming out of our hearts, to the praise of his glorious grace grace, that there would be a kind of Christian exuberance and exaltation is the goal of this passage. My friend, and many of your friend I know as well, uh, Omar Hassan, is a New York Jets fan. Omar is a real fan. He is a loyal fan. Fan. He is a dedicated fan. Omar would tell you that for decades he has sought to follow this team despite uh, a lifetime of disappointment. Um, they, he has faithfully, faithfully followed, would, went to games for many years. And I was, I was imagining uh, what would happen. I was talking to Omar last night about, about the Jets and, and how they're doing and, and as typical fashion, loyal but downhearted. <laughs> and I, I thought, what would it be like... Imagining a scene where Omar's there at his house someday and somebody knocks at the door and he opens the door to find a, a Jets representative there. That would be exciting enough. But then the representative proceeds to tell Omar, Omar, we have chosen you to come on an all expenses paid trip. Uh, to the stadium and and somehow that happened to be the year when by some miracle the Jets had made it to the Super Bowl and and he's going to get to go to the game and so he, he flies him out there and there he is at the stadium and then he finds out not only is he at the stadium uh, he's going to be given access to to be with the team in their pregame preparations. He's going to meet all of them and and get to just get to know them, introduce himself. And then not only that, he he keeps hearing new news. He gets to go with them. He's going to be allowed on the sidelines. He's going to be with them while they go through the game. He's even going to be allowed to be in the final huddle right before the final play in which they win the game. Now, now Omar, one of the reasons I love him, he defines manly exuberance. Uh, generally, if you know Omar, you know that's true. I mean, he, he is a manly man, but he defines manly exuberance. And I was just imagining uh, my friend Omar in that moment when they cross the finish line, clock goes to zero, what it would be like. I wanted to just take a snapshot of his heart and what it would be like in that moment, the kind of exuberance. I mean, it would be beyond imagination, I think, in that moment for him. Now, it's an imperfect illustration because my friend Omar would tell you uh, this verse is more exciting to him than that moment would be. But... I think imagining him in that moment gives us a little glimpse into what Paul is hoping will be the result of Christians reading this paragraph. Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 14, verse 3 through 14, is one long sentence. It's a long, it's over 200 words. It is, I mean, it's the epitome of a run-on sentence. This lengthy sentence. But what is happening in this is Paul is simply expressing this manly exuberance. 
He just keeps going. It's as though a period would be an inconvenience and he can't stop because he has to keep saying again, guess what else? Guess what else? I have to tell you this. And then he, the only thing he can do to interrupt it is he keeps using this phrase, to the, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory. And I think that's the goal for Christians when they read this paragraph. You will never believe this, but you've been chosen. And now let me list what you've been chosen for. And I'm not stopping till we get to the end. It's this cascade, this overflow. It's like a fountain. You'll never guess. You'll never guess what happened. Then this happened. And then this happened. And then this happened. And then I was given this. And then I got to see it. And he keeps going and he can't interrupt himself. And the goal is that, that it would be infectious. That, that the smile would, would spread across our face too. That our heart would start to get full too. And that finally, we would stand up and say, to the praise of his glorious grace. That's what Paul wants for us. That's what we should desire as we read this passage this morning. Now, <laughs> this long sentence is much too rich to try to cover in one one message. We, we wanted to dive in more deeply. Frankly, the first uh, three verses I'm covering this morning are too rich to cover in one message, but we're gonna we're gonna try. I'm gonna walk through these three verses uh, using four points. Three verses using four points. Okay, three verses using four points, all with a goal that we would say at the end, to the praise of his glorious grace. And here's the overarching reason that is emphasized in the opening section of the sentence. The, the, the emphasized reason is that God has chosen you in Christ. If you are a Christian, that, that's the, the cause, that's the motive. To the praise of his glorious grace. Why? Because God has chosen you, Christians, in Christ. So rejoice. Rejoice, because God has chosen you in Christ. That's the, that's the goal. So four points just to walk through. And, and, and let's just let our hearts, let me encourage you, let your heart feel the Christian exuberance it's meant to to feel. This is not a message about obedience. This is not a message about growing in holiness, though they are not unrelated. This is a message really about exaltation, worship, exuberance, thrilling, enthusiastic, on your feet, hands raised enthusiasm. That's what this passage is about. So four points. Chosen. Chosen first for abundance. Chosen for abundance. Verse 3 is what we might call that is the title verse uh, to introduce the rest of the paragraph. It, it's this <laughs> broad summarizing verse after which Paul gets into some specifics. We'll just deal with the first specific in this message. But let's look at verse 3. Chosen for abundance. Point number 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says. Blessed be, uh, the right way to think about that word blessed be is, is something like God is worthy of praise. Pa Paul is stating a fact. Blessed be God is worthy of praise, he's saying. Worthy of praise is God. Who is this God? He's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul peers into eternity past he sees the eternal relationship, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God the Father is the accent in the first section of this paragraph. Then he's going to turn the attention to the work of Jesus Christ. And then finally he's going to focus on the Holy Spirit. So there's this, this Trinitarian exaltation throughout this passage. But he starts with the Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's what that God and Father has done. He has blessed us. That word means the bestowal of a benefit. He has blessed us, and he's done it in a particular sphere, in Christ. And the scope of that blessing is every spiritual blessing. The nature of them are spiritual. That means that the focus here is not on practical blessing. You're going to get a bigger house, a bigger car, a nicer looking face. Uh, that's not the goal here, okay? The goal is spiritual blessings given through the Holy Spirit in the spiritual realm. So this is a switch 
from the Old Testament in which most of the blessings applied, or many of them, were physical. God will bless you with many crops, and God will bless you with a bigger house and many children. In the New Covenant, the accent is more on the spiritual nature of those blessings and the physical aspects of those wait for when Jesus returns. So there's, a, there's something of a switch in the New Covenant that's highlighted here. Every, every, every spiritual blessing, and where are those spiritual blessings located? What is their origin? In the heavenly places, which speaks to their security, the abundance of them, and the fact that now a Christian lives by faith, not just on earth, but in heaven. That somehow we, because we are in Christ, are by faith in heaven receiving God's lavish generosity towards us. Chosen for abundance. Again, it's a, it's a general category. Paul just goes categorical. Every spiritual blessing in Christ. In the heavenly places. God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ chose you to receive the abundance of heavenly blessings and the sphere of those blessings is for those who are in Christ. Now I want to make a very important point. You'll notice in this passage the words in Christ, in him, or in whom over and over and over again. If you look down your Bibles, you'll see that. In Christ, notice this. He chose us, it says, uh, in Christ. He blessed us in Christ. That's verse 3. Verse 4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. The end of verse uh, 3, it says, In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, to the praise of his glorious grace, which with he has blessed us in the beloved. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his uh, blood. Forgiveness of our trespasses, which he lavished upon us, so on and so forth. He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things, things in heaven and things on earth. All things are united where? Verse 10, in him. Verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance. Keep going. In Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Uh, you, you get the idea. In Christ is this massive thing. Here, here's what that means. Jesus Christ is God's chosen person to accomplish blessing and redemption and judgment as it relates to humanity. He is the instrument of God's purposes, the second person of the Trinity. As that person, God <laughs> declares that the name attached to every salvation benefit, the name that he is going to call all of those benefits under is Christ. So you don't want to think of when phrases like in Christ, you don't want to think merely of a, a, a person and somehow I'm inside that person. Uh, this, this speaks of a, a, a legal um, sphere, okay? It's the right way to think about that. This is like a, a legal sphere where you are, you are now placed underneath and within the legal sphere that is Jesus Christ. Now, now you're also connected to him personally and spiritually, certainly. There's a mystical connection there. But, but the idea is... All of the blessings of God are poured out on the Christ sphere, and it is into that sphere that God has brought you. So to use an Old Testament illustration, you might think of the ark. Okay, you might think of the ark. Inside the ark, safety, provision, protection, well-being. Outside the ark, devastation, destruction, ruin. When Paul says, and he says repeatedly, you are in Christ. What he's saying is, you have been brought into the sphere of blessing and well-being and favor and grace. The only sphere of those things, because outside is ruination and condemnation and wrath. But you, you, you are in Christ. You have been brought into inside and inside there you are given every spiritual blessing every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places has been poured out on you why because you are in christ you have been chosen for the abundance that comes to everyone who is united to jesus christ every blessing that follows every blessing of the christian life every hope that we have happens to us because we have been brought from the outside 
to the inside. And the name of that place is the name of the person who made it possible, Christ. Chosen for abundance. Chosen for abundance. Now, Paul moves from this general category and he starts speaking uh, more specifically. And he gives the, the first type of blessing, but it's also the ground of all the other blessings. So the blessings that follow, um, it's not as though these are, these are all the blessings we could think of, but these are the foundational blessings and they cause everything else. They're the, they're the foundational blessings, but they also cause every other blessing. They are blessings, but they also produce other blessings. So that's, that's what he's talking about here. And he, he begins walking through in verse 4 uh, this first blessing. And I'm, I'm choosing to accent the word chose because I think that summarizes the accent here. Verse 4, even as, even as he chose us in him. That's in Christ again before the foundation of the world. So, point number two, chosen before the beginning. You're chosen for abundance. When were we chosen, Paul? Before the beginning. You're chosen for every spiritual blessing. When, Paul? Before the beginning. He chose us, verse four, in him, in Christ, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that, with the goal that, we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Here's what that means. In eternity past, before the world was laid down, God decided to connect your name legally to Jesus Christ. Before he made the stars, before he laid the foundation of the world, he saw you and he chose to decide to connect your name. He chose us how did he choose us? In him. He chose us in him through connection to Christ. It wasn't without reference to the work of Christ. It wasn't without reference to what Jesus would do in history, to the paying for sins and the dying on the cross. It wasn't some arbitrary choice that had no reference to what Jesus would do. It was, it was in him. It was in connection to the work that he would do. He chose us in him with a particular goal, that we should be holy, that means set apart to God, and blameless, that means apart from condemnation, before him in love. And when did he do it? Before the foundation of the world. That means that before the Son was created, you, Christian, were chosen to be holy and blameless before God. That means before he spoke into existence, the stars, he determined that you would be set apart in Christ to be holy and blameless before God. Knowing that you and I and every Christian would be a rebel and a sinner on our way to hell, despising God and hating God, he decided that one I will choose and I will connect them to Christ so that despite what they will look like in all of their own choices and preferences and their pursuit away from God, they will eventually be someone who will stand before me, not with condemnation, but holy and blameless. I have chosen, says God. Before you were born, before your parents were born, before your grandparents were born, before Abraham was born, before Adam was made, God already knew that there would be a day when you would stand before him without his condemnation and he would look on you not in wrath, but in favor. Chosen before the beginning. Before the beginning. Incredible. Now, I want to include a comment here because especially in our country, there is a, a, a commonly accepted phrase that could contradict this teaching. And you, I'm sure, have heard this phrase. Some of you uh, may have uh, thought maybe it was a biblical phrase or something that a, a pastor maybe referenced at one point. The, the phrase is free will. You maybe heard that. Man has free will. Now, 
first of all, it's important to state free will is not a biblical phrase, which doesn't mean it couldn't be true, because there's phrases that we use that aren't in the Bible, they just describe. So that's not like being against something just because the word Trinity isn't in the Bible, but the Trinity is true. Uh, but I have found free will to be a very unhelpful phrase. So if, if, if you believe in free will, um, hear me out. Here's why I think it's unhelpful. The word free will, it contains some element of truth, but it also communicates in a vague way that can be very unhelpful and at times even downright wrong. Where it is accurate is the fact that human beings before God do make choices. They choose things. They choose things. They choose when to get up in the morning. They choose what to eat for breakfast. They choose to see this movie or that movie. And, and those are real choices in the sense that they make them. They're not aware of any person forcing them to do any of these things. It's a choice that they make. And so when a person describes free will, it reflects or describes what it feels like to be a human being. So there's a, there's a certain element of it that is understandable. It, it's accurate even in a sense. God doesn't force you in that sense uh, through some kind of physical uh, effort on his part to will to do things. People that are, are choosing to sin today are not sinning because God told them they have to. They're choosing because they want to. So the, I understand where the, the phrase free will comes from. However, here's where it gets unbiblical at times and even dangerous in its interpretation. Man is not free in every respect. Woman is not free in every respect. It's clear teaching of the Bible. I mean, that's true physically. There's things you simply can't do. You can't chop your head off and stay living. You're not free to do that. Right? There's limitations that are set in by God in the world. We understand that physically. That's also true spiritually. There are many, many choices that a man and woman can make. Here's the one choice that their sin keeps them from making. That is the choice to live perfectly before God. It's not that there aren't many choices they do make, but there is one choice that they cannot make, that I cannot make, and that is to live perfectly before God and earn my way to heaven. That is a choice that we are not free to make. Not because of some arbitrary decision of God's, but because of our own sin. We willingly choose to turn away from God. We have no desire in our hearts. Psalm 14 says, The fool says in his heart, There is no God. We all go our own way. Now, there's many different paths. Some choose a more, more morally upright kind of path, and some choose a more criminally illegal kind of path, and some choose a polite path, and some choose a harsh path. I mean, there's many paths, but they all fall under the main banner of our own way. And the path that we cannot choose, that we do not have the ability to choose, that we willingly reject anyway is the path to live perfectly before God. Which is why I find the phrase, man has free will, to be unhelpful. Because it could seem to indicate what the Bible denies, and that is, man can choose to live perfectly. If that's what free will means to someone, then that is inaccurate. That is not what the Bible says. And it's helpful to note that here because that is one reason people dislike this doctrine, which is described as the doctrine of election. God chose us in him. So people will say, good, solid Christians will say, well, God chose me because he knew I would choose him. He, he looked into the future, and he knew that I would be make that righteous choice. And having made that righteous choice, he then agreed with that choice and chose me. Uh, frankly, I think to take that interpretation does not reflect this passage and many others. I understand the temptation to think that way, but that's simply not what it says. He didn't choose us, notice the wording, 
because we would be holy and blameless, he chose us that we should be holy and blameless. He didn't choose us since we were going to be holy and blameless. Notice the, what's the cause and what's the result. The cause is not our choice of him. The cause is his choice of us. The result is our holiness and blameless before him. Very important to get that right. We'll get to that in the, the third point. Very important to get that right. The cause is not since we would choose him, he chose us. The point is God chose us, and good news, he chose us for an incredible thing. He chose us that for the goal that, the purpose that, we would be holy and blameless before him. Incredible good news. Incredible good news. It's amazing news. It's comforting news. It's hands in the air news. God didn't choose the holy people or those who wanted to be holy. Isn't that good news? Because if it's not true, the moment you stop being holy, you might question whether God would change his mind. But if God chose people who had no intention to be holy and chose them so that they would eventually be holy, then in all of salvation is entirely is in the hands of the Lord and we can have confidence in Him and exult that we have been chosen to the praise of His glory. Chosen before the beginning. I think that's why Paul accents the temporal nature of this. It's not so that we would we would second guess God and think, well, yeah, but God knows before, and so it doesn't really matter when it was. No, no, the whole point, let's take it at face value. He chose us before we were born because nothing we did after we were born would have convinced him to choose us. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon says it this way. I believe in the doctrine of election because I am quite sure that if God had not chosen me, I should never have chosen him. And I'm sure he chose me before I was born, or else he never would have chosen me afterwards. And he must have elected me for reasons unknown to me, for I never could find any reason in myself why he should have looked upon me with special love. Frankly, I find that so true of myself. I grew up in a Christian home, marvelous parents, well-trained. I was not this rebel kid. I mean, I didn't try to do as much evil as I could before nine in the morning. I mean, that was not who I was. That's not who I... But if you were to take a look in my heart as a good kid, oh my... I'm sure he chose me before I was born, for he never would have chosen me afterwards. Chosen before the beginning. James Montgomery Boyce, another quote, says this, how can we possess the blessings God has for us? We can imagine a number of wrong ways the blessings of heaven might be thought of to be possessed by force, which is what Satan tried to do. He tried to conquer heaven. He was conquered instead. We might try to earn these great blessings, but with what would we earn them? Heaven's blessings must be bought by heaven's coin. We possess no spiritual currency. Perhaps we can inherit them when the owner dies. Alas, the owner is the eternal God who does not die. Perhaps God is gracious and is only wanting us to ask him for these blessings. Even this will not work. For according to scripture, we are not the kind of persons who, unaided by God, will even ask him for blessings. On ourselves, we would never ask God for anything. Then how? How? How is it that some people receive these blessings as Paul says they do? The answer is in verses 4 through 6. It is the result of God's own 
sovereign act, election. Paul says, for he chose us in him. Chosen before the beginning. Point number three, chosen for adoption. Chosen for adoption. Verse five says, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. The way the grammar breaks out in this, the original, in the original Greek here, um, commentators think that the, the structure of the sentence is such that He chose us because he had chosen to adopt us. He chose us. The adoption wasn't the result of the original choosing. It was the reason for the original choosing. Another reason why this isn't something in us. It wasn't that he chose us before the foundation of the world because he thought we would make really good children. He decided to make us his children. And therefore, he chose us. It's the reason. For the choosing. We're chosen for adoption. We're chosen because God decided to adopt us. He predestined us. The word there means uh, to be set apart beforehand, is all that word means. Predestined. To be set apart beforehand. So prior to us, God set us apart, is, is what that means. And it was for the specific purpose the purpose of being called the sons of God. He chose us. For adoption. Through Jesus Christ, this was not a, a choice without reference to the redemption price that had to be paid. That's what we're going to look at next week. There had to be a redemption price because sinners must be punished for God to be holy. And so people that are sinners and deserve to be punished cannot come into the family room of a holy God, surely have no right to call God their father unless God makes it possible. So the only way that a rebel can be called a son or a daughter is if that rebel's sins had been laid on something, on someone. And so the surprise of this passage is those who deserve to be condemned are now called children because the beloved child was called the condemned. The reverse takes place. And if you, you look ahead the next couple of verses, you can see that exchange. He, he predestined us. He set us apart for adoption. What was the cost? Well, we would need redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. So the cost of our adoption is the cross of Christ. That's the payment plan. I have dear friends who, who have just taken an incredible step of faith in, in seeking to adopt children over the years. And, and sadly, I know there's some reason for this, but, but it is it's such a burden. Cost, the cost of adoptions are, are, are so high, so challenging. For, for, for families that, that genuinely want to adopt and love children. But no cost compares to the cost to God to adopt you and me. Because no parent on earth would sacrifice their own child to adopt another. That's what God did. Chosen for adoption. Just to explain the legal background of this phrase, the idea here uh, is that a person would, would adopt someone so that they could inherit, so that they could receive the inheritance. And so immediately introduces the surprise. God has no need for anyone to inherit anything for two reasons. First of all, he's never going to die. And second of all, he already has a son. So the only reason he would adopt us is because he decided to lavish his generosity on us and Jesus Christ decided to share with us the glory that was his exclusively as the beloved son of the Father from all eternity. No wonder Paul says to the praise of his glorious 
grace. Grace beyond imagination. Grace beyond evaluation. Grace beyond description. Grace that we cannot comprehend. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That eternal relationship between Father and Son, which was temporarily broken on the cross. Why? Why? So that you could have some marvelous child to lavish affection on. So you could have someone to increase your joy in heaven. So that you could finally have an heir and so you wouldn't die with that one no for none of those reasons only because there's a sinner and i've chosen to make them a child j.i packer the great theologian wrote knowing god which if you've never read i would recommend that book he says this in adoption god takes us into his family and fellowship he establishes us as his children and heirs. Closeness, affection, and generosity are at the heart of the relationship. To be right with God the judge is a great thing. But to be loved and cared for by God the Father is a greater chosen for Adoption to the praise of his glorious grace. Now these choices that God makes, I think it's important to point out two crucial applications that sometimes Christians, including myself, get wrong. This doctrine of God's gracious choice to choose before time and to adopt children as his own, this choice is is not a choice. It is never intended to be used to create pride in the Christian. How contradictory would that be? Never intended to create pride in the Christian, either towards other people who are currently far from God or towards other Christians who do not yet understand this doctrine, which sadly is, is present at times in the church. People who have learned and been taught the glory of this doctrine, yet somehow it becomes a, a means of boasting towards others and, and, and a degree of even shaming others who have not yet learned. L let's be clear. The doctrine of God's choice of people who are responsible for rejecting him contains mystery. It is at times hard to understand how man can be fully responsible for his choices and yet God choose some to be saved. That is not an easy doctrine to understand. It's mysterious and no one understands it perfectly. And so if Christians look at other Christians and say, how can you not believe this with a, a, a demeanor of, of arrogance or self-confidence? It's totally contrary to what this passage should do. And I, I sadly have met Christians who, who seem to use this doctrine as a, as a way of looking down on those who have not studied this or learned it yet or are struggling even with it, the difficulty of it. Don't do that. Don't do that. If you meet someone and, and their response is to say, I chose to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing to say to them is not, no, you didn't. The first thing to say is, marvelous. I'm so glad you believe in Jesus. I do too. And maybe on some future day you can say, you know what's even more amazing than that? Ephesians 1 says, God chose us so that we could choose him. Isn't that incredible? I know it didn't feel like it. But behind the scenes, he was at work. But don't say that the first day. The doctrine of election should cultivate humility and gratefulness and broken-hearted worship, never pride. Another false application, passivity in evangelism. Passivity in evangelism. God chooses them. God saves them. Let me know when you show up. Quite the contrary. The knowledge that God has chosen to save some should give us incredible 
confidence to share the gospel. Because if the only ultimate solution to people being saved is the effectiveness of our witness and the power of their response, oh, wow, great despair can come over a season of time where we don't seem to be effective. And yet if we know that God has chosen to save some, we don't know who they are, and it's not our job to figure that out. It's our job to preach the gospel and declare all who will may come. And we know that some of those wills are going to be changed by the power of God and will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we do? We share the gospel with anybody and say, if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And having believed, we say, to the praise of his glorious grace. Charles Spurgeon said, a controversialist, <laughs> I love that description, a controversialist once said, if I thought God had a chosen people, I should not preach. This person says, that is the very reason I do preach. What would make him inactive is the main spring of my earnestness. If the Lord had not a people to be saved, I should have little to cheer me in the ministry but quite the opposite is the truth the Lord has a people he has chosen to save he has people in this city he has people in your neighborhood he has people in your family he has people he has people to save chosen to save, that he has all power to save, and that for some mysterious reason he has chosen to save through the means of Christians who are weak and ineffective, sharing the gospel with them, and through that weak and ineffective preaching, all of a sudden it's revealed God chose to save that person. Point number four. Chosen by glorious grace. That phrase, to the purpose of his will. The word purpose there, it doesn't just mean an idea or a, a plan. It has the idea of desire and joy. I might even say to the pleasure of his will. What it means is that God derives pleasure from saving sinners. What does God enjoy? Adopting you. What's one of the things that brought God joy for all eternity? I've chosen them to be holy and blameless for adoption. Isn't it great? Can imagine the conversation with the Trinity in eternity past? They're going to be adopted, chosen. I can't wait. And when you consider who he is talking about, imagine Paul writing this. Blaspheming persecutor of the church. He writes that word to the purpose of his will. No wonder he says in verse 6 to the praise of his glorious. The, the word can mean weighty, deep, heavy, magnificent. It's this this heavy word, and he's using it to describe the grace. How can I describe the grace that I have just been talking about? How can I describe the kind of grace that finds pleasure in saving rebels? How can I, how can I describe it? It's glorious grace. It's, it's grace that is God-like. It's God in its depth. 
Because he's blessed us where? Not just in some random category. People get to be in the distant part of heaven, living in a shack, far out of reach, but thankfully not in hell. No, quite the contrary. They have been blessed where? In the beloved. How do I describe this grace? It is magnificent. It is deep. It is beyond our comprehension. What is this grace like? It's like God himself. Why? Because the grace has been poured out in a particular sphere. Which sphere are we in? What category are we in? Maybe in the distant category, medium category, close but not all the way there category. No, no, no. You are front row. You are in the beloved. We weren't fans of God. There were only two teams. We hated his, and we loved the other one. To the praise of his glorious grace, favor to those who should be punished, the choice of those who would Run from God. Now, how does this apply on Wednesday morning when you wake up and some sin comes to your mind? Or on Thursday night when you are struggling with some awareness of your weakness and your vulnerability? Or you look at the future and you're not sure whether this child or that aspect of your marriage is going to succeed? Or you face some difficulty with your boss at work? How how does this make any difference? This isn't a a passage about, well, be, be patient and be loving and be kind. I, I, I need practical handles. Here's how it makes all the difference. In reality, whatever appears to be the case in your life You live with a crown on your head, with rings on your fingers, with a robe that is covering you, with a home, with God in heaven. All of this is true right now because of God's grace through no effort of your own, which means that no effort of your own can remove those things. That is true of you. You have been chosen in Christ, Christian. What else matters? Stick this truth in the doubting thought that comes to your mind this week. The despairing thought that comes to your mind this week. Think think of those thoughts like like a little fire that raises up in your soul. A, A little flame. Doubt. The smoke begins to come into your face again. Hopelessness. Lack of worthiness. Despair. Uncertainty. Faltering. Insecurity. Conflict. Future fear. What's going on around the world? What will my children face Does my wife love me as much as I want her to? Will my husband ever change in this area? Will this child actually make it into the future? I am afraid. I have stumbled again. And the smoke of fears and vulnerabilities and weaknesses begins to rise in our soul. What do you do? You take the fountain of Ephesians 1 and you pour it over that fire and say, Chosen in Christ, I need nothing else to be true because if that That is true. That is all I need to rejoice and declare to the praise of his glorious grace. If your heart is doubting, remember you are chosen in Christ to the praise of his glorious grace. If your heart is dry, return here and remember you're chosen in Christ to the praise of his glorious grace. If you're more aware of another person's sins than you are of your salvation, return here and consider you're chosen in Christ to the praise of his glorious grace. And if you're here and you're not sure you want to believe in God 
and you're not sure you want to follow God, consider the God that is laid out in front of you. Not some hard deity disinterested in people on the earth. No, a person who lavishes grace and chooses people. And do not make an argument that I don't know if I'm chosen, therefore I cannot come. No, if you come, you will know that you have been chosen. The call of the Bible is come. Come to him. Come to this God described as a God of grace and mercy and abundant redemption. Come to him so that you can rejoice with us to the praise of his glorious grace. Redemption Hill Church is simply one choir in a great chorus. We have our song to sing. We have our part to sing in that song. But the song is to the praise of His glorious grace. We, through no merit of our own, have been chosen in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for any person that has battled condemnation, fear, doubt, guilt this week, that the flood, the cascade of these verses would overwhelm their soul. Lord, I pray for anyone who is worried about the future, that the cascade of these verses would enrich their soul. I pray for the dry heart that finds meditating on you a difficult task, that you would turn the desert into streams of water through the richness of this passage. And Lord, we declare as a church to the praise of your glorious grace, to the praise of your glorious grace, Grace, we declare all glory and honor and strength and dominion and power forever and ever be to our God and unto the Lamb, for He is worthy to the praise of Your glorious grace. In Your name we pray and we sing. Amen.